uh, uh, guest slash extended visitor that will be around, uh, James Pierce, who is a PhD student that has been working with me for four years. It's been longer. Yeah, you're in your fourth year. Um, <laughs> Uh, in four years, uh, he does a lot of techniques in design and design research. He's been looking at a number of things in uh, the areas of energy and materiality, and he has a lot of a very broad interests. And it, I, I asked him, I don't know what he's exactly going to talk about, but I sort of said, show some of the things that you've done and some of the directions you're headed. The main thing for folks here is that uh, James will be here for the rest of the semester settling in, so you'll see him sitting and Bluing and biking and all kinds of things, and um, it's a real pleasure to have him here. And hopefully, you guys get to know him and have a little um, not for the people that are remote because you're too far away, but we're going to have a little uh, <laughs> local gathering to welcome him here too. You'll have to get some mail about that next week. So, with that, uh, cool. thanks. So, I'm afraid that so we have to get a mirror image here. I don't know. Design. Who's, who's remote? <laughs> uh, no one is remote, but we're recording to YouTube. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I have kind of just put together some projects that I thought might be interesting. Showed you guys because you don't know me and I don't know you so well, so I figured sort of a survey of different topics would be the best approach to go with. And as usual, I'll end with some sort of things that are on the top of my mind to put some feedback on. Um, so I'm not sure how you normally run these sessions, but usually what I like to do is just interrupt at any time because conversation is usually kind of the way to go. So if it doesn't make sense, if you don't agree with something, whatever, just, you know. OK, so that's what I do. Um, most of the work I do has these sort of three strands. Sometimes one takes priority, sometimes another takes priority. Oftentimes it's two or more. So it's designing things, building, making things, making artifacts. Um, it's studying people doing interviews, going to people's studies, talking to them about their things, so on. And then theory, so reading and writing, using um, criticism, humanities, and philosophy. It kind of uses a lens to bring to bear on interpreting field work and interpreting artifacts of it. So start by talking about what I'm not going to talk about, um, which is some of the more pu kind of pure design ethnography work. Um, so a big part of this work is, is with domestic possessions, so things like um, product attachment. What sort of things do people really grow attached to in their homes, like cherished possessions and things like that. Um, or, or material reuse, so um, modes of consumption outside of traditional retail, so um, uh, dumpster diving, going out and looking for trash and stuff like that. Um, and then always sort of tying it back to newer digital interactive technology, talking about how those things matter in the context of interaction. So I also do work that is more purely design theoretic, so divorced from any sort of empirical kind of work other than using examples. Um, so recent interest that I've that I had is this idea of, of undesign. So this is the Berkeley Center for Design. Design things, you design things. Um, but design, traditionally, is all about the creation of novel forms, right? And so, definitely true, that's what design is about. But I think it sort of obscures the other part of design, which is that everything you make displaces, destroys something, right? So, the fact that this screen is here, and I'm giving a presentation on this screen, you know, precludes the possibility of us sitting around and looking at my face the entire time while we're sitting around and sort of like that. Um, and so I won't talk too much about this, but, but the idea is to sort of talk more explicitly about how we can design things affirmatively with technology that are actually, their intention is to negate things that we've already built or designed. Um, so an application area, two to really think about here would be environmental sustainability, um, which is one important one, um, and also sort of more moral concerns like busyness and overwork, right? So things like Twitter, and Facebook, and email, and those things are all great. We all love them in a lot of ways. But there might be ways to sort of talk about um, inhibiting or displacing some of those things intentionally through design and technology. So just leave it in a super abstract level like that. Move on and talk about something bit more concrete. 
Um, I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about um, the energy work. So this work started with a pretty simple idea, which is that energy is invisible, electrical power is invisible, but it's also intangible, right? It's not something that we can literally feel and touch directly. Um, and so there's reasons to care about energy, right? Environmental sustainability and things like climate change. I guess change. you have never been sapped before. Sorry? You have never truly been sapped by 220 volts. Right. So you, <laughs> exactly. I had that experience. Exactly. So, right? so there are those kind of moments <laughs> where maybe we feel that for the most part, right, we don't directly kind of mm -hmm. um, experience the surge of power that. coming through. It's always needed to do something, right? So it's going through this screen and we can light it up. Um, right, but with materializing energy, the, the idea is to kind of explore different scenarios that we could design energy and power to have more of a tangible, meaningful presence. So, one of the earlier explorations in this area, um, and this kind of ties back to my interest in, in heirloom possession and, and um, attachment to material objects with the idea of having energy mementos, right? So power is usually um, this thing that's a means to an end. Um, we have energy, we have batteries, and it's just this thing that we use. And you can compare that to something that's more like a more tangible source of power, like wood, for example, right? Where wood, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can chop it up into little bits, you can burn it. Um, and so this is sort of asking these questions about could we become attached to and think about the power that we use on a daily basis as a thing in and of itself, right? As something that we could make and give to other people. So the way these objects work is that um, it involves hand-powered motion or solar or something like that. Um, so for example, you could, um, with this one, you could crank it up like that, and then you could give it to someone and it would play back the motion to form of that, or it would look like. And so this is a quote um, from doing some interviews around these objects where people sort of, you know, it's sort of a loaded scenario, but just the idea that there is something, I think, there about this idea that um, you can materialize energy, you can make this intangible thing, something that's more concrete, something that you might become attached to. So later on I'll talk about more sort of relevant areas to think about is wind and solar power. So right now most of our energy comes in through an outlet and a service anonymous source, but if we think about generating power from renewable resources, then something like emotional attachment to energy becomes a bit more easy, I think, to wrap our, our hands and minds around. Okay, so kind of scaling up a little bit, going from small little pieces of energy to more meaningful kind of uses of it. Um, so this was a project uh, was looking at interactive microgeneration. So looking at basically products kind of tangible products that we use that are hand-powered to various degrees. Um, so this is one example um, from that study. Um, the study actually involved two parts. The first part was looking at, at actual just traditional hand-powered objects, so like a hand saw or a mortar and pestle, and doing some interviews with people to just gauge what was sort of desirable or undesirable about things that were manually powered. And then introducing some new artifacts as probes. So this is an example. Um, of an iPod that would have different icons depending on the sort of the flavor of the source of the energy. Um, and so sort of the idea here that's interesting to think about is if products like this came with something right in the box where it already kind of made its source of energy before it in some regard, right? So if the power coming into our outlets was tagged with some sort of energy metadata, then we went to go charge our iPhone, it could show us the different sources of power that we were using. Or if our home is creating energy, it goes from wind to solar power, and also channels the sources so we'll be able to see where it's coming from. Okay, so the small scale, scale stuff is interesting, um, but I think this stuff really starts to become more um, applicable when we start to think about scenarios like this. So, homes cities, um, local areas that are actually generating their own power, right? So microgrids and so on. So um, an earlier project that we did 
around this same was that you have the local energy lamp. So um, imagine if we were sitting in this room and it was not today, but if it was a sunny day, <laughs> um, it's a little windy today, so maybe we're picking up some wind. But the, the, the lights would subtly kind of change to a blue or orange tone to show you that it was your home was generating energy, your building was generating energy. Um, and so it'd be interesting actually to think about it in the context of the workplace, which I have been too much consideration to, but especially in the home, I think, and we did a field study which I'll show you, but it's this idea that you might think of that energy as something that's yours, that you have some ownership of, because your home or your city is made it in some sense, so it's connecting you to that source of power. Uh, right. So this project was taking that idea a little bit further. Um, so if you don't know, there's been a lot of interest in energy monitoring from the HCI community and industry. Um, a lot of these devices, they show you how much energy you're using, basically. So it'll say, like, you know, you used, you're using X amount of kilowatt hours this month, or you're using X amount of kilowatts this moment in time. Um, but a big opportunity that I see that the people aren't really looking at as much is these emerging energy systems. So thinking not just one or two years out, but much farther down the road in how things like global energy systems could be materialized in the home in a way that makes them more meaningful, enjoyable, and more interesting. So what this is is a very simple type of indicator that basically shows. Um, so we use this weather station to sort of simulate what it would be like to have a local energy system that's creating wind and solar power in your home. So these two bars right here just fluctuate up and down in unmarked units, which is an important part of this. I wanted to kind of stay away from the whole <coughs> miraculization of everything, just try to give people a sense of there's a lot of wind, there's a little bit of wind, there's a lot of sun, there's a little bit of sun. Um, and this is the total amount of power that your home has. So this is not the most um, viable scenario, but I was interested in this idea of treating your home with a battery so that you actually have power that's sitting in your home you have some control over. And so it was a functional system in that it simulated this idea of, of actually using the energy. So um, there's a weather station outside. I was sending data to the computer, and then that was updating these monitors or sprinkled around the home. So it's a relatively short study. I think it was about two weeks um, each home. Um, there's definitely some shortcomings in this approach. Um, I'd like to do another version of this study and try to make it actually the ideal situation would be to find someone who already had, you know, that was actually generating solar power, wind power in some sense. Um, what was the focus of the study? What's the question of the answer? It was right. an exploratory study, so it was really just about asking very broad questions such as would a device like this um, lead to new ways of thinking about power and energy in your home? So it certainly wasn't, you know, did people use less energy? We weren't, you know, we weren't measuring, we weren't evaluating it in sense. Um, How do you evaluate but, that basically as an interview after while? Yeah, after so it was, it was a series of interviews. Um, and actually the system broke down once it started back and it's time to go back and talk to people. Um, but yeah, it was a series of interviews. So I think there was two interviews per week for two weeks. So, and then a pretty substantial beginning interview and then end interview. You probably have a very um, skewed set of um, potential persons because only if you're interested in this thing in the first place will you even consider well, so, having yeah. this spot if you force it on somebody who thinks that he has an inalienable right of free energy coming out of that club, he doesn't care where it comes from, right? Would that have an influence? <laughs> so actually it's interesting. One definitely is skewed. I mean when you only have a couple people it's gonna be skewed. Um, one of the groups was, was very environmentally focused, you know, on the permaculture and he was super into sustainability kind of thing. The other group, less so, they were a bit more technical though. Um, but it was interesting, actually the group that was less interested in sustainability issues actually took a stronger affinity to the system itself. So, for example, they were talking about, well, it might be fun to try to make bread on days when the wind was blowing. This idea that we kind of have these celebratory situations just because there's a surplus of energy coming into the home, which is kind of a neat idea. Um, and to that, I'll say that I see a big point of doing this kind of work is 
not so much for the evaluation. I mean, it could be, you could use this as an evaluation type of program, um, but more so to kind of get those pieces of design inspiration to see which directions, which sort of future paths could be worth pursuing, right? Um, so this idea of building a type of system like this in the future, something infrastructural in the home, that did kind of lead to these celebratory, mundane sort of celebratory instances where you think about which is solar power. Okay, so I kind of started at the small scale of the energy mementos, went back up to you know homes that are generating energy, and then I'm going to shoot back down, talk about the more recent work, um, which is really looking at how do I say it, sort of the, the material properties of electrical power as it's materialized in interactive technology. So this was a recent recent Kai paper. Um, we're using form studies, um, sort of as examples, of, to develop a theoretical understanding of what electrical power and electric technology is. Um, and so this is a set of examples around hand-generated power, with the idea being to sort of say, um, hand generation is something that's very distinct from um, the, the ordinary electric technology that we have all around us, right? So what type of temporal and spatial forms are even possible electrically with something you'd generate by hand, right? Something like dropping a weight to illuminate something or cranking something up to illuminate it. And so one of the, res the restrictions on this set of, of prototypes is that there was no um, chemically stored power or electric surplus of power. So everything that was created, all the forms that were created, um, were done by um, either the stored mass of a weight or the body that was generated from your own your own body. Um, and so then some of these were sort of scaled up. That one wasn't actually functional. Um, but then the idea was to say, OK, so if you have this, this array of forms, such as tapping a piezo sensor to illuminate something, um, cranking, spinning, um, dropping a weight, what sort of higher level forms then could you create realistically? So if you look around, we have all these different electric things around us. Like dogs, phones. <laughs> if not dogs, they're active, but they're, they're really in a different system. Um, but what are these meaningful forms that we use in our everyday life could realistically be hand-powered to some extent, right? And so I guess I'd say a little bit more about why that's an interesting question. Um, one of it has to do with sustainability-related issues, but one of it um, Another question just has to do with how we relate to those objects themselves. So sort of a strand running throughout a lot of this work, um, based on interviews, this idea that there's certain things about non-electric things that don't require an external source of power that are valuable to them, right? Like, so if you have a book, the book is static. It doesn't, it doesn't change. So it's kind of a bummer because you can't queue up you know, or search whatever word you want to in that book, but the book stays as that book forever, right? So you can become attached to that book and think of it as that book and know that I don't need to go find a source of power to use this thing. It's just going to be there as it is, right? So that's one example of a sort of property of non-electric things that we sort of lose in some sense when we move to something that's powered externally, so that's externally powered. I guess well, two classical examples come to mind is one was the, uh, you know, the old watches that had a, a weight inside and yep. would wind yeah, yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also example. even my parents already had a, a hand cranked, you know, flashlight for emergency, so you didn't have to, you know, when batteries were harder to come by or more expensive, that was always there. You needed it, you just did this, and, and you had your light. So and there was something special about you know, both of these, um, I think, um, you know, pieces of technology. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that those, those are precisely the two ordinary sort of examples of this type of electric technologies that are bodily powered that have made their way into everyday life. I guess bicycle, bicycle light generators would be another one. Um, solar power calculators for a while were also something that was similarly not bodily powered, but environmentally powered, right? Um, Right, and so it sort of gives it a durability and endurance when it's something that doesn't depend on this external source, this external type of power. 
And so something like e ink is really interesting then because it's a super low power technology and it's dynamic and it has a lot of the properties of um, an e screen for what is, what is e ink? Yeah, so electronic ink, um, if anyone you know has a technical description that's better than mine, please offer it. Um, but basically, um, you electrically change little pieces of pigment and they remain there without power. So you give it some electricity and it makes an image on a screen, you remove all sorts of power, and the image stays there. Oh, I see. For it's instance, on a candle, basically. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, okay, it's hard to describe. You have a particle step in the cell. You basically electrostatically move forward, and that takes no power to keep them there. And if they're in front, they're looking black, and if they're behind the cell, then yeah. it looks white because the liquid in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. um, but from a, from a design perspective and a material perspective, it's a very interesting digital material because it's electrically inactive while it's visually there and active, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's an example of something that I think in the future we can imagine being sort of like the quartz watch, right? Where it's something that that, that lives, that exists um, interactively in the sense that it's dynamic and changing and fluid, similar types of properties to an electric computer screen now, but distinct in that it would have a durability in a lifetime that's <coughs> independent from having to plug it in or having the battery die and sketch so. sketch. Sorry? Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> yeah. But so etch sketch okay. you need to turn yourself to, to move it, right? There's a one-to-one -one correlation between mm -hmm. I move this and that moves up. I move that one and this moves up. So how do you... Whereas with something like e-ink, it's a press of a button and things fly around and do all sorts of crazy things. If right? there is the battery in here or something, right? If or a computer working. Right? Mm -hmm. So is there a version of e-ink where you have like a, a touch screen and you just basically you draw with your finger and all of that and yeah, that would by itself that. activate you know, whatever it is and, and, and change the state. And that would be really cool because then it's a really it's direct interaction. Yep. That's a very interesting idea because things like piezo is an, is an example. I mean, it's super low power, so you're, you're mm -hmm. but if it's something like e-ink, um, it is an open question about could you have these interfaces where the little motion that you, you're already accustomed to through things like button presses and dragging your finger along the screen is generating all the necessary power to make it the interactive thing that it is. E ink is also a slow refresh rate now, so it works for the pitch, but not like for video or really highly yeah. interactive. Yeah, like that. <laughs> so, kind of pushing along this theme of durability is one aspect that's related to the source of power. Um, this is a, um, a concept for a device where uh, you could take videos by cranking the reel, so generate the videos like that, and you could play them back, again, all hand-powered. Um, so as a concept, we're starting to illustrate this idea that you could have an electric thing that could live more similarly alongside something like a handwritten letter or a static photograph that just is in a box where you could 20 years later, 100 years later, pull it out, and it would be there, and you wouldn't have to hunt down sort of a source of power. And so, experientially, it's not so much about saying, well, literally 100 years from now, I'm going to take this thing out, but the way you treat this thing in the moment is always based, I think, on those projections of, of how things are going to be into the future, right? So. If it was something that you knew could subsist and last indefinitely, independent from some larger system, it would change your relationship almost necessarily to that object, right? Maybe not in quite as profound ways as I'm suggesting here, but nonetheless, in different ways, that object would exist differently in your lived experience. That's what I claim I have. Right? So what's next? Ah, okay. So this is when the work becomes even more. Um, Less refined, I talk about sort of the things that we're not at the moment. So, well, that's hard to read. I'll read it out for you. What is interactive technology and how does it present itself in use? Um, so, power, electric power, and energy has been sort of this theme that was running throughout all those works. Um, but I think it's tied in an important way to understanding interactivity, what we today call 
digital electric interactivity. Sort of a very vague, amorphous term, but usually when we talk about interaction, the assumption is that we're talking about something that uses logic power, right? And so I'm sort of taking as a starting point this idea that electric technology and digital technology is, um, is synonymous with, with interaction, right? So interactivity is based on logic power. And then kind of going backwards and asking, OK, what aspects of interactivity actually depend on it being electric? Or not? And so, um, so an interesting place to think about would be art objects. So something like Dan Flavin's work, um, where he uses fluorescent lighting, he uses this common everyday object, um, but positions it as an art object. And so for me, it's really interesting to look at this object, this illuminated sculpture, about doing refer to the sculpture, in relation to some static, familiar kind of object in the gallery, right? So there's something that automatically differentiates this artistic object from everything else in that gallery. And if you think similarly about things that are more commonplace, like digital photo frames, where automatically those things become distinct from something like a static picture in a frame. Or can I, there's can I challenge your <coughs> notion of interactivity? Um, oh. Sure. It's not a good moment. <laughs> did, did I, did I, did I, I make I, a strong claim about it so far? <laughs> OK. Um, I'm not sure that power is the first thing that comes to mind. For me, what interactivity entails is if you have some way at the higher level to interact with something on an influence. It could be an entirely mechanical gadget. It could be a sculpture made out yeah. of goosenecks. And you're allowed to actually touch it and bending around. You know, that would be interactive. Yeah, I, um, just get, I just get this is a good example, too, right? You, you proposed the Etch-a-Sketch earlier, right? Is the Etch-a-Sketch interactive? That's definitely interactive, yes. yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> or so you know, movable, movable sculptures where the, the public is invited to actually go and move it around. So a copy or, um, You should talk to Jimmy Andrews at some point. He is a PhD student of mine. And we are creating this user-guided inverse 3D modeling you know, where we we, we take something that has no structure, maybe just a point cloud, and try with just a little bit high-level interaction and guidance, extract a parameterized description that then easily can be used to design a new thing out of that. And the interactive part is not so much that you have you know, low-level notions of moving individual points around, but that you can give direction says, treat this part of the object as a sweep, treat this part as a rotational sweep, treat this part as a quadratic surface. So with a few high-level <clears throat> inputs, you achieve a major change on how the system behaves. And I think when I, when I look at good interactivity, that's kind of the thing. You, you give some high-level commands, you make a few things, and you have a dramatic input of what the system does or how it behaves or how it looks at. I, I, I totally agree. I, yeah. I, I, I have to be on the side of the folks, because I think you know, interaction, uh, certain <laughs> Uh, intuitive mechanical aspects to it, and there are plenty of non electrical you know, useful instruments, toys. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things, and actually, the interaction is more natural in a lot of ways because they're relatively they're, they're mechanical, physical things which people can intuit pretty easily. But with electrical things, there's a this gulf, right? This gulf between physical stuff and the bits inside that actually make it hard to interact typically. With, you know, we, we engineer them to sort of make. And of course, the stuff that we know, but actually, I think the kind of interactive is, you know, plus the things that don't interact like your lights and stuff. But, but we actually work, we work hard to make the interaction work because so I think it's not natural. I think somehow that, yeah. you know, that, that, that golf needs to be there, right? Because it's what we're fighting in the human absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's an interesting point there. Right? The, the richest interactive things are electronic and digital, but it's not like they're naturally so. I'm actually essentially in agreement with everything that's been said. So I think I'm in, I'm in the same boat as you, but I'm curious. So how many people here do interactive, work with interactive technology? Yeah, right. How many people work with mechanical systems, <coughs> purely mechanical systems? Green building or this? It's part of your research. You do interactive <coughs> type of research. If you ride a bicycle, is that interactive? Not so, you think of the research things? It, it, I'm not sure. I think you know we could define it in different <clears> ways. Um, 
But I think there's definitely something about electronic technology, which is that it has this, these three distinct forms, ordinary electric, electric technologies, where there's an object, and there's something stable that persists, right, that we think of as inactive. So when I turn my laptop off, the laptop is there, right? Then there's this electric, this active materiality that comes on. There's the sounds that come out of the speakers. There's the imagery that dances around on the screen, right? There's the, the buttons that I hit to control that. <laughs> and then there's something else that presences itself, which is the source of power, right? So based on the way that this thing operates, there's times when we've all run out of battery and you simply cannot activate this thing any longer. There, the laptop is still there, but that activeness is gone. You can't bring it back until we connect it to something else. So something like a bicycle, does it really have that, do those, those things sort of, they're more, they're more woven together, right? The source of power is my own body. It comes from this, um, this embodiment, this sort of symbiosis between my body and that object where I can't even think about the bicycle as being active unless I'm on it. I don't guess that's exactly the point that John tried to make, that somehow, particularly the display screen, right, mm -hmm. is something that's kind of, um, can be very, very much alive if the battery is there, but primarily you have no interaction with it, you can just watch it, right, and we have to then work and somehow make it a touch screen or give you a cursor or some mouse buttons mm -hmm. in order to be able to influence what's on the screen. Whereas with mechanical parts, you know, basically either you touch them and do something with them or you don't, right, it's not this gulf that, uh, as John describes, it has to be overcome with some extra user interface design or something to make it interactive. Yeah, absolutely, and that can also be, yeah, go on. To throw one more thing out, I mean, the, 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 rather than a, the interaction, I would think of like a lot of it's a natural way to pass it. They really are, I mean, anything like to include my house, I mean, house is off power, it's like, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold, I think, just like, sure. material, dead material. <clears throat> when you put the electricity in, it's sort of alive, and, and, and things that are electrically powered to people have still sort of alive to them when they're powered. Or when you, know, when you shut it down, it's either dead or asleep. I think the aliveness seems to be, which can incorporate interaction, but it can also just do its own thing. The TV pretty much you can turn it on and off and then you do a little bit. It's yeah. not interactive, really, so, but it's alive in a sense. It's, sort of, it's got this complex behavior that you may be able to influence. Uh, but often, you know, the other thing is interaction is really narrow it's on the terms of the machine. That's why I'm a little bit uncomfortable. You know, it's alive, but it's not very, <laughs> not very flexible or sophisticated the way perhaps the real life thing is. Right. So, so, so it's sort of certainly experientially, yeah. techno all technical things, active or otherwise, are different from even that dog, right? Because a dog has its own liveness to it. Yeah, but it's not under our control, right? I think it's not something that we can. Yeah. So, I think there's an interesting relationship between, in, you know, the power and the pace of interaction. You know, what what uh, Eric alluded to in terms of the refresh rate with the Kindle is just one example, right? If you have power, you can just take the pace of interaction to something that might be perceived as unnatural, right? As opposed to a pace that is constrained by physics. Pace, yeah. It, I think if by pace you're talking about sort of speed and instantaneity and things like that, then definitely. Because, actually let me just get back to this right here. So I think there's three sort of aspects that sort of emerge as interactivity when we talk about electrical things. So one is this, exactly like you said, there's an activeness to it, right? And electrical things, non-electrical things can be active too, right? People are active, dogs are active. Um, something blowing in the wind becomes active. But with electrical things, um, and some mechanically powered things as well, but especially with reliable, a reliable source of electrical things is there's a staying of this activeness, right? That projection is just, it's staying up there. I can make it stay up there, and it's doing its own thing. It's being active, and actually in that case, its activity is defined by the fact that as soon as I remove power from it, it disappears, right? Different from something like an etch sketch where once it's there, it's, it's sort of there, but I know that it's not something that's mutable in that sense. The other is this, this otherness to that activity. So when I make that stay there, I can walk away from it. And it, we don't think of it as an other thing, but it's it's doing its own thing independent of me. Different from a bicycle, for example, right? When I set the bicycle down, the bicycle is just staying there doing its own thing, but it's inactive. Whereas if you have a motorized vehicle, 
we, we know that thing can have an otherness to it. But I mean, until the battery runs out, you walk away, this just stays there, just like the bicycle. It doesn't change, it will be there. And so I'm not quite seeing the difference here. Mm -hmm. So, well, it could be something that or it could be a movie. In that case, it's certainly moving, right? In the case of illumination or an image graphic that's static, its activeness, I would argue, is defined by um, what it's not. It, we understand its activeness in relation to what would normally not be there, which would be darkness or the absence of an image. So we, we tend to think of light as being active because we're used to darkness as being a state of inactivity. Yeah, I think there's a psychological grounding in, in that. Um, yeah. The experience, I would, I would say, that we do tend, I mean, we see something that's lit up, and we think of it as an active thing. Whereas we don't, we could, we could try to constitute this cup as something that's actively um, you know, molecules that are actively bound together that are making it support itself like that. Because we don't trust its present with the absence of it, with emptiness, you know, and define that as some kind of an activity or a liveliness. I mean, as I say, it's psychologically, we're more, we tend more to associate light and the sun and warmth and so on with this activity of life than the presence versus the absence of that thing. So. Exactly. Sure. And I should have probably made it more clear that the perspective I'm coming from does take sort of a psychological, phenomenological approach to saying mm -hmm. we can define things however we want, but it's sort of a naive sense when I walk down the street and look around and you ask me points to the things that are active, that are enlivened. I would point to a person walking, you know, dog barking, the street lamp that's on, possibly the sun, right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't point to the cup that's sitting there unless someone was moving it around or something. So, so all these notions of interactivity I'm talking about are based on this sort of naive understanding of how we go about our, our everyday sort of pre-scientific understandings of what makes it effective. Um, so, for example, something like Let's go back to the art world for a moment. Um, I'd argue with something like Dan Clavin's work. What's interesting about it is that it sort of presents itself as this object, this sculpture. But really, we always know that it's different, at least in one sense, and that is that it goes off at something, right? So, you know, the wires are all hidden here, and it's sort of mounted on the wall. Um, but eventually, it turns off. And so it's sort of suggesting itself as this lasting object, um, but really it's not. Really this is an activity to it that's dependent on some other sort of source of power that's making it what it is. And so it's similar for things like the digital photo frame, where it might sort of present itself as a picture that we're used to that just stays there and is what it is forever. Um, but we always understand it to be this dynamic thing that changes, and it can be turned on and off. Um, so the image itself, then, is always going to be different from the static photograph, because even if it's not moving, even if it's just up there statically, we know that it's something that can be changed. We know that it's something that can be that can move around. And so we can always sort of tease apart this active electric materiality this image that's presented on the frame, the physical screen, those things can always be sort of torn apart. I wonder about your uh, your book example. Um, when it's mm -hmm. dark, you can't read a book, but you could read an e-book if you don't have a light. And if you're blind, you can't read a book, but you can read an e-book. So if you're blind. You can uh, not, you mean auditory or? Yeah, I mean, you could yeah. have it speak. Yeah. So I'm not even sure the book example works in this framework. Because, so I would say that with a book, certainly you need light. But we understand that light when I'm reading a book is not coming from the book itself. That comes from the electric lamp, 
sun from some other source. But we still understand, when we put that book away, we don't think this is a book light. It, this is only exists as that when that, that lamp is there, right? It's not like we think of that book as having a lamp built into it that we must plug in. in I agree with that, but I, I think that your bigger point, though, is sort of this thing doesn't change. It's sort of standalone and mm -hmm. can always be used. But when you think about it, you can't use a book if it's dark. And you can't use a book if you're blind. True. I don't so, think we think about that, though, in the well, same way that it, it doesn't change our sort of relationship to that book. Maybe because we're just not thinking carefully, but if you're somewhere without a lot of power, where it's dark a lot of the time, you probably do think that way about a book, and maybe you prefer an e-book that has a built-in <laughs> light. Yeah, so certainly I'm not arguing that one's better than the other in terms of preference. Um, well, I mean, maybe it's no, just I would a still say bias that. in terms of how we in here think about books, but it might just reflect our current living situation. But if you lived you know, somewhere where there's only a few hours of daylight a year and you don't have a lamp, um, or where you can't read because you don't have sight, you may perceive books differently. It's a very interesting question, actually. Yeah. Um, so certainly all this sort of analysis is based explicitly so on ordinary, ordinary in the sense of the things that we're accustomed to in this room. In, you know, generalizing outward. I think you have to be aware of that but because whatever. even when you talk about the photo frame, mm -hmm. uh, you bring in somebody you know from Africa or Inuit or somebody who has never seen that. You know, yeah. for them it's just a picture, and then they're very surprised if suddenly they look away. There's a different picture. Says, "What happened? You know, was that magic or something?" Yeah. So I think certainly. our perception and how we think about things is very much based on our culture and how we interact with things daily. And it probably changed over time, so it changed from one generation to the next. So what you're doing in this interpretation is of a snapshot of today of a particular kind of um, group of people that you know are used to a particular technological gadget that, that we're all talking about all day. Yeah, I think I mean this is a great point, it's a great question, and I think that it could definitely benefit to, yeah, I don't know if you want to say possible, but to try to grapple with some of those other ways of constituting these things based on to what extent is it cultural? Because without question, it's cultural to some extent. I mean, there's no way around that. Um, yeah, I think that cultural aspects is determined somewhat by our notions of permanence. You know, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, my kids cry when I bring home a toy with a battery because they know I'm an unreliable source of batteries. And so they realize <laughs> that if a toy doesn't have batteries, it's got a permanence that a toy with batteries will never have, right? Similarly, in you know places in India and Pakistan, there's this thing called load shedding, you know, and so because the power is not there every day, your interaction with electric objects become very different because you have a different notion of permanence. You know, I think so. A lot of what you're talking about is, is intrinsically related to this notion of kind of permanence and what you can depend on and what you can't depend. On. Exactly. Yeah. And I would actually say back to that point that there is one crucial source then that we can talk about, and that is the sun, which regardless of, I mean. If you're living in a cave, perhaps, which, I mean, you could think of an example, but light doesn't exist in a cave. Light exists out in nature with a capital N, and so the sun is always around. So I would say that if you can read, if you're able to visually perceive text in a book, that um, some of the things I was saying about a book always being there, accessible, would hold true across cultures. That would be my guess, just based on the notion that the sun is a source of light for seeing is something that we, as people, I would guess, you always understand. You know, always the book, I have a problem. I have some 30-year-old photo albums. The light at night they could read, but they had no camera. If I look into these photo albums, those photos don't look anything like what they looked 30 years ago. No, some they, of them they, were a bad batch, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and all the hues are gone except the blue, and it's like blue and white, what used to be color photographs. So very clearly, I've become aware of this is not permanent at all. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, still, it's a world. It's it's still very distinct from the abrupt, instantaneous yeah, appearance and disappearance. Right. It's just permanence again. Has but to no, scale that's, I mean, to you're it absolutely it. right. That, and we do th we do think of. I mean, we don't think of. So I'm certainly not saying we think of. You know, paper is lasting forever because we don't. We understand that it ages over time. And we, you know, we write. We sometimes think. You know. Will this last? This is acid free paper. I mean, you know, precious so memories memories certainly not copy this. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of plug them in. You know, what do you do with that, right? The font's too small for a lot of people. It's often, some people are not where they can get access to light because they're in detention and they don't 
have the sun. I mean, there's, I just think there's a lot of assumptions built into, I mean, I have that intuition about books too, but that's mm -hmm. just, you know, I am bringing, um, and the thing about the batteries is a good point, but I, it's another form of technology, just like the things with electricity, and I'm not sure it, that example really works. Well, so I agree that it's all technology, and in some sense, we don't need to, there's really no, I mean, so I'm actually a very big proponent of saying that there's a lot of value in not treating, not starting and saying, oh, this is electronic, this isn't. Automatically, there's going to be a huge, you know, difference. That, or I can't read the book without my glasses, but I could it, read an exactly, e-book without it's, my it's glasses. Always, it's always because mediated. Because I could hear the audio, I put it on the audio version mm -hmm. if my glasses were misplaced. So I, I think there really are a lot of assumptions to that. Mm, assumptions, assumptions I don't know about, because what I would argue is that things that are electric experientially are different. They're distinct. Yes, I won't disagree with that. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is tease out what some of those differences are so that we can have some understanding of how it's different from the things that aren't. And um, how do I say it? So it's like the whole time it's sort of you know trying to actually break down that electricity or interactivity has anything to differentiate itself, right? So looking for examples of things where, oh, it's actually not about that because some other traditional type of technology exhibits the very almost the identical kind of properties or essential characteristics. I think I just had issues with how you were characterizing physical books, not mm -hmm. so much how you were characterizing electrical. I, I think I think it's fair, but probably we should. I think you know. I think you know. You're looking for sort of a pre-reflective realism that's shared by most people, which is fine. But I mean, I think it has to be relative. It has to be sort of culturally situated anyway. Culturally, and you know, for the differently able people can have different senses of that reality. Obviously, one sure. person completely different senses of the world. So I don't think you can claim. Well, there might be some similarity between some of these things, but I think it's better just to say, yeah, we'll just take. Certain cultural locality, so right? This is yeah, yeah. Because honestly, I mean, otherwise, if, if you try to do more than that, it's not very realistic. I mean, to claim that there are sort of somehow cognitive universals that are not cultural. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely not. Even at, you know, pre-attentively, mm -hmm. pre-reflectively, it's, it's kind of true. But I think there's a space <laughs> between you know claiming a clear boundary and and, and not. So. Um, I mean, definitely what you're, you know, to claim a universal would be silly, right? Because our ordinary sense of electric power is always based on, first of all, this notion of electric power, right? We know what electricity is, whereas, you know, in other places, you wouldn't know what electricity is. So there's always going to be these yeah. things which just by definition almost would lead to different sort of even naive, um, under-reflective understandings of that. Naive is so thing, clearly, yeah. You know, yeah, we put colors down for permanence and impermanence. I think it's it's you know clearly food is, is not very prominent. On the other hand, I had a gingerbread house that kept me for six years. Right. It was more or less you know I would say that was permanent. You know things things you know, <laughs> everything becomes, everything goes away over time, right? A thousand years, not much left of anything. So I mean nothing's really permanent. But when it's on the scale of months, I would say naively people have make that boundary. And and of course you can find its edge cases, but I think it's reasonable that you know because because you're really trying to see understand how people see the world, and that's it. Pre-reflective thing, so it's got to be, you know, you've got to sort of accept some of these things. Yeah, that's a great point, though. So I guess all of that raises the question: What you want to do is it? Why are you trying to distill out this distinction? What's like the deeper question behind it, and why do you need to know whether it's one way or another? I mean, what you hope to accomplish in, in, in the very end? And if you if you understand that question, then you can see how relevant or irrelevant that that subtle distinction may or may not be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because so, I think, you know, there's the, the what you can do, like searching, which you can't do over a physical book, and you can't do electronically, so that's sort of a different feature. But the actual consuming or reading of the book, um, which is the core of the book, core feature, if you will, still makes a difference, electronic or not, for people with, you know, even a fully able people in different circumstances. There's no life. Yeah, you know, so what is the essence of what you're trying to get at? Yeah, no, great question. I should get more clear. One, one important question is to understand what is the, I'm putting big quotes, essential um, possibilities and limitations of material that we think of as 
knowledgeable expert practitioners as interactive digital material. So there's a designer who crafts interactive material, computation, electric things, what can and can't we do with it in maybe an app server. I mean, I'm, I'm cautious of using those words, but in a more general sense, right? So there's been a lot of interest in, in Kai, for example, um, actually in all areas of design, was trying to take some of these you know, properties of older technologies and put them into new <coughs> technologies, which is great, which is wonderful. We should definitely be doing that. Um, but with something like this book, are there limitations? What is, are there sort of design limitations on the extent to which that ebook can be like what we know as a paper bound book? Well, that's an engineering question. That's very different than the set of mm -hmm. questions you've raised here, you know? There is an engineering question there, sure, but I'm looking at it from, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that as, as fact. The engineering question is, is been built, the technology is there. From the perspective of use, from the perspective of me interacting with these things on a daily, meaningful basis, what differences, what sort of differences would or would not always present themselves between those in two types most of cases, I think, as Marty pointed out, there are half a dozen advantages, say, in an e-book or an ordinary book that you can really point out. Mm -hmm. And normally, this new technology actually gives you many more possibilities, capabilities, if you're not naive enough or stupid enough to deliberately squash some of them, right? And so it's, it's a good question to see, have we lost something if we went from the old-fashioned to the new system? Exactly. What discipline may have lost? And then it's an engineer question, how do we bring it back? See, but that's where I would just start to push back and disagree, because I would say that that's a common mindset, is to say, well, you can actually do everything you can do with the digital stuff with something, sorry, with the traditional thing, you can, you can always have that with the interactive thing. So, for example, with a digital photo frame, you can have it be a static image, right? You can have it be the same picture you had before, but you have more. You can make it another picture. You can make it a moving picture. You can do all these different things with it. So that that's sort of the naive assumption, technically speaking, I think, is that, well, we just gained more. But one thing that's presented by the show is that you've actually lost the possibility for that picture to only be that picture. You've lost the possibility to walk into your room and say, this is that picture of that time when I was sitting with my friends having dinner, and that's what it is. And I'm experiencing it as such. This isn't, I'm not talking about like how you explicitly say that. I'm saying that that picture would be there as that picture, something you have to literally take off the wall and put something else back up there for it to be different. That's gone when it becomes something that's just electronic. Whether that's a bad thing or a good thing, I'll set that question aside that particular example. Hey, what I was just saying that your iPhone could never be just a phone. For because your iPhone is a million things in one, you can't actually have the experience any longer of simply calling someone and knowing that we're just going to talk. <laughs> we're not going to get a text message, but we're talking. Right? So those are the types of examples, I think, that this kind of way of looking at those things can help servers. I was challenging kind of the, I, I, at first I was buying the, oh yeah, the book is 24-7 a book, and then I realized actually it's not. Because if you don't have light, you can't actually read it as a book. And it's sort of an assumption that you can't always. And I started thinking about, it really isn't. We just assume you have always have access to light and to a situation, get quiet in a situation where you can read the book, which certainly isn't true for a lot of people. So it really isn't 24-7 a book for all. That's why I was, that's just kind of the lines you got me thinking on. <laughs> just like the picture frame, yeah, it's not always that picture. The book really isn't always a book for a lot of people. Unless you're very privileged. Yeah, related. I mean, I buy your book story, and I think, but it's related to different things than power. I think. I mean, the permanence agency. Mm -hmm. I think is also no, important. Just, just with the batteries, you know. Again, agency is. is really important. If I feel like I'm in control of making this mm -hmm. book always a book, then then I feel like it has a more of a durability, as you call it. Right? Agency always, is also. You important. have no power and no life. But, you can't read them. I mean, so you're gonna, you're actually over time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. people are gonna. I don't know if you want to kind of uh, take a couple more minutes and just kind of. Bring us to some uh, closure. Uh, it's a great discussion. No, this is just one of the most incredible things. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is more or less stuff that you're thinking about now. Because like, I thought, otherwise, you should tell us like, what you're thinking about now. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's along these lines, I guess. I don't know if I'm going to show it, but basically, building some, trying to explore some of these things more tangible, building out kind of. Um, Things that exactly the kind of things that you were talking about. These, you know, 
limitations of the devices. So <laughs> things like, you know, is it still interactive if we can't actually see the images that are there, right? With we, you know, they're there in the atoms, you know, that have been actually manipulated. Um, I mean, what I'm a little worried is that a lot of these things are very, very interesting if, if you're a degree in philosophy. <laughs> you know, and Shastras or somebody like that would have a, you know, you could purpose in all night and discuss those things. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think your degree wants to be in HCI or something like that. So you have to come oh, yeah. up with it. It's a You can do whatever you want. You know, some, some questions yeah. that in the end, you know, you mean, really make a difference in, in the way you design something or in yeah. the philosophical yeah. background, how you think about it. No, I appreciate it. Try to distill out what the questions might lurk around all of these philosophical yeah. questions that really are then worth exploring. If this had been a pod presentation, I would have begun with some work on creation. Well, but no, I mean, that's, I mean, definitely you're right. This is not I just, supposed I to be I think there's polished. an idea there, but I, I just suddenly realized that really you can't use a book unless you have energy from the outside. That's why I was I want to write a book. Yeah, that's why. No, I mean, I realized that really you need power in either case. All right, how about a blanket? <laughs> I will bring it back to the sun again, and I think that a lot of this does come back to our understandings, which are culturally mediated, of course, but of what is natural and what is sort of a baseline. So um, even something, for example, like something mechanical, we literally couldn't create that thing without electronic means of production in many cases, but we still experientially understand something like this to be more akin to looking outside and seeing these natural forms. Which is different. I feel like you have more control actually. over something where you can crank it than light, unless you're Harry Potter and you have like the wand or something. You know, you can't make light. Well, I mean, or the goal of this kind of work is to raise questions. You just want to raise the right kinds of questions. It's not to be the right I think I'm, questions. Yeah. So, so you want to make sure you raise the right questions. Yeah. Yeah. that's fun that way. Uh, I should have said that earlier. Yeah. The point yeah. is to raise questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true that I mean, so so, so the work of James does certainly has a lot of philosophical questions, but I think. One thing that he, he does is the questions he tries to raise or um, push on are things that are about the sort of living with digital technologies and the kind of interactions we want to have. And so some of these, they're almost provocations or probes highlight the, the kinds of interactions and issues, be they good or bad, to just draw out that distinction and then Yes, there's a philosophy about questioning that, but that it's actually trying to point to like future kinds of uh, methodologies, how we want to design things or give opportunities to designers to say, oh, these are sort of features that we've identified that could create very different experiences, be they about um, kind of longevity or things about you know, heirloom status or things about just a richer experience. And so he's sort of trying to tease them out, and some of these are really drawing on philosophical constraints. So there are, there, I, it sounds philosophical, but some of the elements are ultimately trying to go towards designing real systems and studying them in context and actually um, kind of takeaways. I think it's just a little more interesting to also think philosophically about them too, so that's what I think. I think they're real questions. I mean, even just yeah. ar archiving web pages, right? That's like a more practical yeah. thing. Yeah, that's right. You know, you go to, a, I was just looking at an old news article and the links are all broken, right? So my stuff's all gone. You know, what, what does that mean? It's, it's really the heart of the intuition that you're going for here, right? Is that ephemerality or the batteries aren't there, is it going to work when you come to it later? And um, I guess my issue is like, does this trend now to only punt to the physical? I kind of feel like it's punting. I mean, I think we do need to solve the problem of the electronic, too, and how to make that preserved. I, I don't think that we should give up mm. on that. And there's sort of this nostalgia thing going on, you know? I, I think he's doing that. I mean, like, some yeah. of what he talked about is about that, right? Like, the video camera that... Yeah, I think this is like kind of interesting. Like, yeah, I don't know. It, yeah, it becomes something that is contained in itself because the energy you can it's true, but who wants to have a thousand boxes lying around? I mean, Probably that's why not. we have things online. Right. So I think, you know, it's good to do this, but there's kind of a lot of this nostalgia happening now that I'm finding a, it doesn't really solve the problem, in my opinion. So, well, of course, it's kind of an idealization, idealization because what's really inside the box that you're cranking? I mean, isn't there something that may give out over time? Maybe even e prompt that only oh, can, yes, can be changed a thousand yeah. times and then it's gone, yeah. or, or a dynamic yeah. memory that if the, the power drains away, it's gone. So, yeah, all of these button. may give you an extra factor of 10 or 100 in some hands of durability, but when you really probe down to it, 
it's not, it's not all that permanent. Either, just like yeah. my other photographs. Yeah, yeah. No, so I, and I, should, I need to I need to diversify aside from just the sort of nostalgia, durability kind of aspect to it. Because it's you're not right, just you. It's, it's a whole a, movement in the Kai community right now. But I think that we do have to really get real about we do have hundreds of millions of pieces of information electronically, and we need people to be able to get to them and mm -hmm. restore them and make them available. And, there is a material basis to all that, though, which I guess I would say is unavoidable, right? I mean, there's certain what most think and there are computer cases, and so and we don't have a good solution right now. I don't think it's no. a good solution I, at all. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have tapes that from Bell Labs I mean, with the book up on CCDs. <laughs> Nobody can read that tape anymore, you know. Then the next generation have floppies. Totally I don't solved. know what to do with the floppies. So I've totally seen three technologies in forty years yeah. Yeah. That, have, that I have. Put things down for permanence, and now I cannot even read them anymore. But I think his whole game like, is to play with that permanence. Really I don't cool. think it's the goal is not to make things permanent; it's to play with the permanence. The goal is not to answer the questions; it's to ask them. Right? So, why? I, 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 because that's that's the epistemology of this it's work. You know, that's doing more than making them. I'm sorry, I have to go. Philosophy. That's fine. I mean, I think you guys can have different yeah. epistemologies. It doesn't necessarily need to be utilitarian. You know, you could say, hey, you know, I'm just interested. I mean, I don't. I have a different taste. He's like a more philosophy. Don't forget that. <laughs> 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 you just think you're you just think you do engineering, but really you're a philosophy. You're a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. My uh, diverse offense. Uh, one of our teachers once hurled at me. He was kind of a very intellectual guy, and he actually grew up in a, in a convent and so on. At some point, he was really, really mad at me. And he said, you engineering brain. <laughs> right, so that's like the worst you could do to me. And I felt kind of proud about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't hurt me at all. Here's the one thing I really do want to try out, which is my, my, my biggest offense, uh, which is, I think these are good questions to follow, but the, 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 the cultural dimension makes me very nervous. The, the difference between, um, you know, if we even localize in, in let's say, a, a northern economic culture, the difference between middle-aged people right now and say children or children a few years from now who basically, you know, generally speaking, experience the digital media first. They probably start with ebooks. They haven't quite it haven't quite happened yet because in many families, but you know and you have to explain what a book is. Yeah. You know, and so it, actually my son calls my dad a book. The book. Yeah. yeah. So how it happens. Yeah. <laughs> so then that's this ground truth. And that's sort of ground truth of, of media is you know you have to explain what television is. Yeah. Because they just used to Turn on Netflix or something, and you have a show. Um, but anyway, the, the, I, I think things change significantly. You know, cognitive, fairly deeply at cognitive levels as well as. So I think I, I personally am very interested in those differences, and those have a real design implication. So I don't know if you can, if you're interested, but you know, even without going to say developing regions where things are really radically different, yep. you know, probably your question. I, I think. There's a question whether this question even makes sense in, <laughs> a, a, in a culture. Yeah. Well, because the conceptual uh, uh, what do you call it? conceptual um, clustering in more primitive cultures this tends not to be attribute based. Yeah. We're taught to do yeah, that yeah. in, in yeah, yeah. primary school. So same with electrical things, it doesn't even make sense mm -hmm. to have that category. It's not a natural category. It is for Westerners. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the long drawn out version of electricity only comes into this analysis later. It begins by just without assuming much power in some sense. But, but, the, but the whole question of you know, what is that? People don't even care. <laughs> they, 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 they have you know, entertainment stuff, they have cooking stuff. They, these are different categories. Whether they're electrical or not, they don't, that question doesn't enter the way it does. Or think 20, 30 years ahead. But, and now but, everything yeah, yeah, is but, based on living tissue. Knowing I mean, there's electrical luminescence sure, and stuff like that, yeah, and no right, real currents and battery. And everything is kind of living material. And then yeah, yeah. you get yet another category, you know, mm -hmm. how do you deal with those? Technologies, you know, technologically trained people. I think there's a different approach to these kind of questions. I think we're actually in agreement, though, because yeah. it's, I, I, the thing is I'm focusing so much on it that it makes it sound as if I'm saying in every kind of interaction, it's like yeah. this is electronic, but really I'm just saying that it's, um, they're always possible. Yeah. So they happen. It's not like in our everyday meaningful going about, we, these things present themselves like that. Yeah. Seriously, certainly not. But I do think that it's a very interesting question. But I, I, my my suspicion would be that these some of these ideas generalize across all these issues just based on. But you should probably go and find that out. I mean, I think I, I agree think with John. So. I, mean, I, I think I think these are learned in childhood. Generally, people's understanding of the world is learned, you know, from age two or you know, they, they just. 
physically manipulating things and have digital things that manipulate those. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would still say that the kids don't do that much yet. Okay. I would still say that some of the aspects of the otherness of an active thing that does itself on its own is totally independent of these notions of electricity and whatnot. In those, you'd be able to tease out amongst anyone. But I think it would be interesting for you to look at other cultures and what other means in other cultures, and that gives you a better relativistic sense of where that attribute comes from, right? And I think you might find that some of these, when some of these things don't have permanence, it actually increases your understanding of the mechanics. So. If you have to deal with intermittent electricity, for example, you might have actually a more nuanced and better understanding of what it is yeah. than if you rely on it consistently, oh, right? Yeah. And so I think cross-cultural work might be really Start interesting. Yeah. Under your control. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 Make, make you value the source of energy much more than when you take it for granted. I think you have an entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be an excellent study that I've been mm -hmm. hoping to find opportunities. Someone did it. I mean, someone, uh, Susan Weish, I think, did a, did a study yeah, of looking at these kind of uh, yeah. oleos or whatnot. Yeah, right. nice Thank, you. Thank you. <laughs>